executive director for Neighbor to Neighbor. They are, um, as you know, have, we have a new executive director. She started late uh, December. They have a, <coughs> a uh, new construction project going forward and working to um, provide services to some of our most needy in the community. I'll be looking to schedule a tour for them. They'll be truly able to appreciate the space that they're going to be moving to. I've scheduled a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce to start doing my uh, some more business outreach to understand some of the pressure points on, on businesses and how to uh, improve and, and continue. So please, as we say at every meeting, if you are affiliated with a neighborhood organization, a not-for-profit, uh, someone providing services in town, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the things that you're working on and how we can better support your efforts and also learn more about the pressure points so that we can start to address that on a policy point as well. Thank you. Thank you okay, uh, going on to old business, the first on the agenda is the scenic road designation for the northern loop around Vinnie Park. Uh, and Candace Garthwaite is here. Where would Welcome. you like me? Wherever, Where you feel more, <laughs> wherever you feel more comfortable. Okay. Um, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Candace Garthwaite. And I'm here um, representing Eastern Greenwich Residents and Eastern Greenwich Preservation Association on the topic of the Binney Park Scenic Road. We've been here before, the last meeting, so I'll give a brief sort of summary for, for the record. And uh, then obviously if we have additional questions or comments, that's great. Um, so then, it is the Planning and Zoning Commission that has the authority to designate scenic roads. And so we, as those who want to push this forward, must submit our, our application to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It is a long pathway to get there. <laughs> so that's why we're here <clears throat> once again before the selectmen. The municipal code requires a written statement of approval by owners of a majority of property that abuts the proposed scenic loop. And again, this is the northern loop around Binney Park. And since the town of Greenwich owns Binney Park, and Binney Park is a major abutter, we need permission from the selectmen in order to submit our application. And the selectman needs to get permission from the RTM because it's the RTM that represents the residents who ultimately own the park. It's kind of a long, <laughs> long way to get to why we're before you today. So then, that written statement of approval by owners of the majority of the property is an important step. We have to have that before we can submit our application. All except two of the 13 private owners of property along the route <clears throat> have given their written approval. All property owners receive registered letters. The two owners who did not respond rent their properties. The Parat Library and the First Congregational Church signed written approval forms. And it is stated in the municipal code that owners of properties on scenic roads preserve their property rights. The Scenic Road Initiative is aligned with an objective in the new 2019 Plan of Conservation and Development. The very first guiding principle in that document is, quote, to preserve our community character and sense of place. So this is one of the driving factors for those of us behind the Scenic Road application in Old Greenwich. Additionally, in the 2019 Plan of Conservation and Development, there is a statement of an objective, which is, quote, to encourage the designation of more scenic roads throughout town. And the Binney Park proposal would be the first, uh, of, of first official scenic road south of the Merritt Parkway. Currently, we have five, and they're all north of the Merritt Parkway. And again, as I said before, this would be the first application where the town is a major property owner. So it's, it's more complex. Uh, so what are the benefits of a scenic road designation? Well, again, in the town municipal code, <coughs> section three, it states, scenic roads are irreplaceable resources. And also in the municipal code, it states that scenic roads are for the benefit 
of present and future generations. So again, this is a driving factor for those of us behind uh, this application and, and this desire for a scenic road designation in Old Greenwich. Uh, protecting the roadway it can really enhance the historic buildings in the area. And those include the gorgeous Jeffersonian Parrot Library and the First Congregational Church and its graveyard. The First Congregational Church was established in 1665. So if the planning and zoning, so if we can go forward to the RTM with your permission, then it is the RTM that ultimately will have to vote to allow the selectmen to sign the approval form, which we have here. <laughs> and then we go before the Planning and Zoning Commission. So it's, it's a long route. If the Planning and Zoning Commission should determine that this is the proper designation of a scenic road in Old Greenwich, this would once again go before the RTM, before the RTM's final approval. So that's where we are today. We're seeking permission to submit our application and actually pay uh, you know, our rather significant application fee of $1,200. So that's where we are today. Thank you, Candace, for that wrap up again of the summary of your proposal. Um, as you know, last time you all were here, uh, we had uh, wanted another look at it because we had had some concern from DPW, zoning, and the law department. Um, circled back with each and was uh, told by one that uh, it was fine to send it on, so I came back and told you that I was fine with it. We did get another email yesterday that the concerns, the, the previous concerns are raised again and that it should be better off as a historic district, but I gave you my word that I would uh, vote to pass it on, so I will live by that um, and let the discussion continue with the RTM and then ultimately with zoning. Would it be all right that Riverside Association is here today and I would love to have her speak on behalf of the Riverside Association. Sure. Is that all right? Sure. All right. This is Linnea Can I just ask a quick question first, Candace? Yes, of course. So what we're voting on now is not um, the statement that I just asked you about the, uh, the property owner's agreement that they sh it should be a, a scenic road, but the referral to the RTM for the RTM to decide whether the Board of Selectmen, the first selectmen in particular, is authorized right. to make that determination. Correct. So the RTM will effectively determine whether or not this, go this should be a scenic road. No. no That's so. my question. No. What is the... Well, the RTM, no, no, they, will they, go they, before the RTM twice. Yes. It, it is a little confusing when you're dealing with municipal code language, you know, from 1992, which was taken from the state, and the state actually doesn't even use the law or this language for their own scenic road designations. So here we are with 1992 language, and the process as is laid out in this municipal code section three. There are many, many steps to even get to the point of submitting the application, and this is one. So we had to go to all of the property owners seeking their permission. Now, what Jill's question is, is this, does this mean you are approving it? So that's where the language is tricky. Approving it as the property owner. Approving, right. So, but it's the, but the it's RTM. Going to, the RTM is going to approve as the property owner. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. <coughs> go ahead, Renee. But to be clear, it's planning and zoning it that will yes. make the decision. Oh, yes. 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 This is just the one of the steps. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's really specific states. to the language in the statute. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So Not you're the sending it to RTM to approve owners. your signing. To From the RTM to the zone. Yes. Okay. I you. make government nice and <laughs> lot, lots of checks and balances, <laughs> shall we say. So. Yeah. So if we could hear from Linnea and, and anyone yes, else who might want, who's here today and might have something to Good say, morning. I would appreciate morning. it. Thank you. My name is Linnea Stenberg. I'm co-president of the Riverside Association. And I'm here to speak about our board's enthusiastic support for scenic road designation of the Loop Road around Benny. Our members commented on the importance of the historic landscape of Benny Park on one <coughs> side of the road and the historic buildings such as Pratt Library and First Congregational on the other side. 
the road is also the entry to the village of Old Greenwich. We wish to compliment Old Greenwich residents Candace Garthwaite and Rita Baker for their initiation of this project and encourage the selectmen to support it. Thank you. Would you like okay. my comment? Sure. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this? Okay. So I guess we're being basically being asked to <coughs> send this on to the RTM to be placed on the call for the March meeting. Correct. Okay, well, I move that we send it on to the RTM to be placed on the call for that March meeting. So I just have a, a couple of comments. Um, I'm, I'm going to vote to, in, uh, in, in accordance to pass that on. I do have a number of concerns that uh, are specific to um, access to old Greenwich residents and, and safety um, in the event of emergency conditions and the additional hurdles that are placed on government. The government's role is, is safety essentially and maintaining its access points. This a scenic um, road designation doesn't prohibit the Commissioner of Public Works from making a decision in the event of a, a public safety incident that um, that a change or an alteration is required, it just places additional hurdles. So I do have some concerns about that. But since our first selectman, who is in fact in charge of those operations, uh, has indicated that he doesn't have the same, uh, that he's willing to pass it along, then I'm certainly not going to race, other than to be aware that um, there are environmental conditions that uh, present access questions that have been raised by the uh, our departments that I, I think that we want to give full weight to, particularly the amount of traffic that goes through, the safety of vehicles and pedestrians um, as well. However, on the other side is the protection of character and environment, the support for the community and the outstanding support. So I just wanted uh, to raise that awareness. And uh, I second your motion. Okay, thank you. We will move that on. And one note that uh, Jill's correct. I mean, the intense vehicular traffic was never really, um, you know, answered. So that's certainly going to be uh, looked at uh, both through our team and ultimately through zoning. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time twice. Do we need to take just say we're voting? Yes, take yes. a formal vote, please. So, okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, two to nothing. All righty. Next, uh, you know, under old business, is Patricia Sesto, our Environmental Affairs Director, on the proposed Energy Commission. Yes, yeah, so I have uh, been before the board a couple times now, and my takeaway from the last meeting was a positive one, but the board didn't actually vote to support um, the Energy Commission. Um, so it would be terrific to actually have that vote. Um, this update since that time, have met with several um, members of the RTM to get a feel for what the issues are. Um, one of them being the issues of why coming out of the environmental affairs office yet going to ultimately reside within the office of first election. So um, speaking with Fred, and I think yeah, they'll tell me right if I'm not here, the first election is okay to be uh, replacing me as the sponsor of this uh, commission so that clarifies that one misunderstanding and uh, continue to work to justify a commission versus a committee. And to that end, um, remind this board that it was several boards ago, back in 2008, that the first effort to have an energy committee began. And here we are 11 years later, still without meaningful achievement. So that is one measure of um, the value of a committee versus a commission in this instance. And so, thank you, Pat. Some of the, the concerns that we've heard from uh, RTM members that we've gone over and I think we've addressed uh, is concern that it would be a runaway commission, not, uh, not uh, under the control or review of anybody, but it would need RTM approval and uh, for the audits, right, that involves money, so that would have to require BET approval and hopefully those audits would actually end up uh, coming back and, and saving us money. Uh, another concern was, uh, you know, being uh, not under the first selectman's uh, jurisdiction, uh, 
uh, Office of First Selectman, so we put it under there. We, put, we proposed to put it under uh, our office. And then, um, so in our discussions, uh, Tap and I, we talked about maybe uh, putting a five-year look back. So come back in five years to see, to get, again, get a reapproval and to measure us, uh, ourselves, see what, you know, what we've achieved and, and get a second look at it, which I think would really uh, answer the concerns of those who uh, had some issues and, and concerns that this may be something that, you know, out of control, or uh, you know, some, something that takes on a life of its own, if it's not doing any any good for the for the community. But I think the five year look back and reapproval uh, component really is uh, is important. But I uh, understand that we're going to push this off uh, a few months. Yeah. So um, skip the March call in favor of the April call, um, which will allow me to do and you all do more explaining understand why this is of value to the town. Um, it's, to me, the, the concept that it's a runaway, the potential for a one runaway, it's the opposite argument that um, I hear from many that this has no teeth. So it's uh, kind of funny in, that you argue the different sides of the same point. It's much like the Conservation Commission, it's advisory, and the teeth, so to speak, will be something that it will develop, and not so much teeth, but a reputation for providing quality measures, recommendations that ultimately it's up to the Board of Selectmen, the EP and RGM to hold the rest of us accountable for those recommendations or not. So it really doesn't have a capacity to run away. Yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's a function of what others do with the, their recommendations. Yeah, and I would agree with you that this is, was a subcommittee before and it really didn't produce anything. Um, and I think we're all in agreement of the, of the goals that we have here in town. So I am 100% in favor of it, but certainly want to you know, address any concerns that people have as you you have uh, and continue to do. So uh, happy to continue this discussion until uh, we can get a vote on it. So um, do you need us to move the proposed ordinance or just the supposed uh, just the support of the creation of an energy commission? Um, I would say either one support of the commission is fine since it's a document in evolution and not exactly sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there any vote is required right now. I mean, we're... I have heard from RT and members why hasn't, why hasn't the board voted to support this? But oddly enough, um, Ben provided um, documentation from last June where that board selection <coughs> actually directed and assigned to Sandy Litbeck um, task of moving forward to uh, to create this ordinance. So um, well, I, it, I, I'm getting the sense from the entities that I've spoken with that they would like a motion um, to a motion to create the commission. Right, but not to send it to the RTM yet. No, 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 no. Just the the concept of the, the value of an energy commission voting to approve creation of an energy commission. Okay. I, I know uh, um, Selectwoman Raven's not here. She uh, originally did have uh, some concerns about the commission. And you know why? One of them was why a commission when we don't have commissions for other things. Um, and was concerned about you know uh, accountability to it. But uh, when I cir circled back with her last week and brought up the five-year look back, uh, she said that she was good with that. But I don't want to speak. For her, but um, she seemed to be uh, uh, in approval at that point. But certainly, we can we can move to uh, support the creation of an energy commission, but not to send it to the RTM just yet. Okay. Yeah. April. April. Okay. So um, we won't even put that in there. Just that we'll just yes, say. Understood. Uh, we'll move to uh, for the create to support the creation of an energy commission here in the town of Greenwich. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, two to nothing again. Thank you. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Any comments or anything? Okay. Okay, going on to new business. The proposed 2020-2021 Harbor Commission budget is Frank Mazzi. Morning, Frank. Good morning. How are you? Good. Uh, <coughs> the 
the budget is required to go before your board of selectors for approval. Uh, it's a small budget. It's a little different than the regular budget for the town because the money comes out of the dedicated fund. It doesn't affect the no rate taxes at all. And uh, it's changed not very much this year. It's gone up $6,000 this year over last year for one reason. Um, <coughs> Out at Captain's Island, there's a lot of moorings, a lot of anchoring on weekends, and it's gotten very crowded out there. So we thought we should put in a no wake zone. There's a fairway that runs through there, and boats can run fairly quickly if they want. And uh, we started it about a year and a half ago, and we budgeted for two buoys in last year. But uh, we have to get it permitted by the state. All buoys are permitted by the state deep. So uh, we went to the state deed, and they said, uh, they came down and reviewed it, said you don't need two buoys, you need six buoys. So we had to add four more buoys into this budget, which made the difference in the budget of about $6,000. $6, and the money all comes out of the reserve fund that was paid for by various morning fees over the years. And that fund has about, uh, $250,000 and you know we're drawing it down maybe five six thousand dollars a year so in 50 years we'll draw it down <laughs> uh, and uh, that's where we are do you have any other questions no uh, it's not approved by the RTM it goes just for <coughs> the uh, BET for approval and that's it okay thanks for your, your total budget 65,000 65 and your revenue coming in is about 54 and a half. 54 and a half. So we're dipping yeah, into about... We've like actually increased it about $5,000 over the last year. We're slowly building up and getting a so that good bad space on the more. So that would be the 6000 Yeah, this way. Okay. All righty. Uh, I have no further questions. Jill? No. Um, thank you for your work on this uh, as well. And for those in the room, it, your budget does get presented, although not voted on by the RTM. They do have access to it, is included now in the budget book. So uh, I know that's been. Right, you got it in the budget book. It's in the budget year. book. I know that that has been a point of que uh, a question for uh, some of the residents. They wanted to know about the budget, so it is now transparent. Yeah, we in the were budget always book. very happy to have yes. it in there. But yes. Right. So, um, so no, I have no questions, and uh, it is there's some shifting, but very, very minor. And thank you for your hard work on. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. So, um, we have to approve this budget, right, Frank? This right. is a vote, right? So, I move that we accept the proposed 2020 2021 budget for the Harbor Management. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, another two to nothing. Thank you, Frank. Okay, going right along to the next item, which is the pay as you throw ordinance uh, concerning refuse disposal and the abandoned blaze here. Again, thank you. We'll give a this first. Um, and I'll label the PowerPoint there. Yeah, uh, wherever, you, wherever you feel comfortable. Let's do a very quick inter introduction. Should you want to come up here? Or? I'll, I'll stand here. Okay. Like very quick introduction. Uh, ten, today's intent is to have the first read of the ordinance. The proposal in front of you is Chapter 9, Waste and Litter, Article 1, Waste and Collection Disposal. I think your practice has been a first read and a, and a second read. Uh, so today is only just an introduction of the ordinance. Uh, we're running parallel paths. Uh, as you already has been reported, the budget includes this proposal page you throw. So you both need a budget plus the ordinance to allow the enabling of legislation to allow you to do page you throw. Uh, what we have is a presentation that uh, DEP has put together. We'll run through. Uh, but we've been working on this for several months with an internal team of myself, uh, Blaze Leventon, our senior management analyst, Pat Sesto, our Director of Environmental Affairs, and Amy, Amy Siebert, our Director or Commissioner of Public Works. Uh, and we've been working with uh, DEEP and a consultant that DEEP has in this uh, program as well. So we'll have a presentation to go through and we can answer any questions you have on the ordinance. We also have the Town Attorney's Office represented Pat Sullivan, who, who drafted the proposed language uh, in front of you. But I think before you talk about the language, I think it's a good primer just to get the program itself. Sure. So with that, I'll turn <coughs> over to place. Thank you, Ben. We don't have our clip.
clicker, so I'm going to stand up next to the computer. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Blaze Lopkin, Senior Management Analyst in the Office of the First Selectman. I'm going to run through a PowerPoint that was provided to us by Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy and Protection. The consultant that works for DEEP was supposed to be here today and joining me for this presentation, but unfortunately she is not feeling well and had to cancel this morning. So you just stuck with me for the moment. So I'm going to run through the analysis, kind of how we got here. As, as Ben said, this is in the First Selectman's proposed budget. And we knew a few months ago as we were developing the budget that we were going to be facing a recycling crisis. We also knew that we weren't the only people in the state of Connecticut to be facing this. Everyone's facing a similar issue, so we reached out to the Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy Protection to find out what they uh, were doing and how they're handling it. And they have an initiative and a, an entire division, a sustainable waste division, dedicated to this. And they are contracting the same consultant, who's Kristen Brown, and she's working with towns right now um, all over the state, uh, designing, helping them come up with these solutions and designing kind of the solution for the future in the direction of, of waste management in general. So I'm going to run through the, the slides real quick. So quickly, the, why is the state uh, interested in helping towns reduce waste overall? And essentially, waste costs are only going in one direction. They're going up. We we'll also have a better understanding of the environmental impact that waste has. Um, there is also a capacity issue in the state of Connecticut. Um, specifically to the MIRA, the incinerator up in the Hartford area is over 50 years old and they're talking about replacement right now and they're also concerned that that facility might shut down or something could happen to it and that would have, even though Greenwich doesn't send their trash to MIRA right now, um, that would obviously have regional effects on pricing. Um, and in the long term, um, it would also have an effect on capacity capabilities. And the MIRA facility right now, um, that's slated for replacement. They're talking at, at public hearings up there. But that's slated for about $300 million of taxpayer funding to, to rebuild that if that's needed. Um, also, and just in general, recycling and, and disposal costs are continuing to rise. So how could Greenwich continue to reduce waste? You see here kind of the average that everyone was at um, in 1990, and Greenwich specifically is really lucky. We have a great team of volunteers. We have great staff that work down at the disposal facilities. We have really great um, haulers that have all participated in efforts to reduce waste, increase recycling. We introduced single stream recycling in 2011 that we had a lot of great partners on, and have been doing a lot of the right things um, and we continue to have all these education, you know, bottle bills, education programs. Um, and if we stay in the path we're at now, I estimate that we can get down to about 590 pounds per person. Um, and that's including some better technology, some more innovation, continued education campaigns, and, and more outreach. But notably, towns that have bag-based pay-as-you-throw systems, such as Portland, Maine, are already at, uh, today, 286 pounds per person a year, so significantly uh, difference um, and, and as they continue <coughs> pay as you throw bag based program makes all other waste diversion programs extremely more effective textile diversions food scrap recycling and so you can see kind of the direction that some of these other towns are heading in down to 150 pounds per person um, looking here at there are over uh, 550 towns just in the northeast that are using bag based pay as you throw systems already um, some of those towns have been using them since it was first recommended by the EPA in the early 1990s. You can see kind of the effect though, specifically, you know, holding all else constant, you can see the effect of when pay-as-you-throw is implemented. If you look in the upper left corner, Waterville, Maine, they have a good weekly data for their waste tonnage and you can see the difference. The blue and the green is the difference. You, don't, you can tell the week that they implemented a bag-based pay-as-you-throw system in their overall tonnage. Same thing. Malden Mass moving over to the top right, 52% decrease over five years. Dartmouth Mass, 59% um, decrease in MSW. Sanford, Maine, uh, Deep likes to point to this one to just show that it really is the power of pay as you throw that has the waste reduction capability. Sanford, they entered that first drop in that bottom right corner. Uh, that first drop is when they implemented bag based pay as you throw, then they repealed 
the program, and then voters brought back the Pays Youth Pro program a few years later, and it re-dropped off again um, significantly. How a, a bag-based Pays Youth Pro system works, also importantly, the state also commonly refers to this as smart, save money, and reduce trash. So pay as you throw, save money, and reduce trash. Those are the two common names for this program. Um, but essentially, the, the only change is the trash that garbage goes into. Nothing else changes. No programs at Holly Hill change. No other operations have to change. Just residents would end up purchasing a official town trash bag. And that's the, tra the bag that trash would go into and would either be collected by haulers or brought down to Holly Hill, however people handle their own trash now. Uh, the price of the bag is set to cover the tip fee that the town pays. All the trash right now is currently you know, usually brought down to Holly Hill Facility Station, and then the town has to pay to have that uh, removed and brought to an incinerator facility. And so the price of the bag is set to cover that. And then we continue, as it says, other, other programs. It also doesn't require um, any infrastructure or capital investment on behalf of the town. We don't have to upgrade any of our own equipment, upgrade our facilities, because the only change that's being made in terms of operations is the bag that the trash is going into. And, and kind of just continuing that, this slide just emphasizes essentially that um, everything pretty much stays the same. The only switch, as I said, is the trash that the bags are going into. Looking at it, they gave us a kind of a conservative estimate and then maybe a little bit more aggressive of an estimate from Connecticut Deep. Um, and again, they have a consultant that designed this. Her name's Kristen. She has designed uh, programs and implemented programs in, in hundreds of communities just here in the Northeast. And so pulling some of that data for based on our tonnages, about 13,000 ton reduction just in the first year in implementation. Um, and even Taking a little bit higher approach, 13,500 ton reduction uh, just in the first year with some increase. Um, obviously, some of that diversion is going to be going to recycling as people recycle a little bit more and want to avoid you know, filling up those trash bags. Obviously, 13,000 uh, tons of waste reduction is a lot of waste, and that has a significant financial impact for the town. Um, in the budget that was proposed by First Select and Camillo, it, we have a 10-1 uh, proposed implementation. So on the left-hand side, 10-1, that's a nine-month impact of pay-as-you-throw on the budget. Looking at a net revenue, um, a two point, roughly almost $2.8 million. Then 13,000 tons in trash reduction um, equates to about nearly a million dollars in savings. And then, as I said, it would increase recycling, and the town's going to have to start paying for recycling now. So that additional cost is about that $259,000 in the first year. It's important to note that the even though some people ask kind of why we would want to encourage more recycling when we're going to have to pay for recycling now, but the tip fee difference there on the bottom of the slide, you see the trash tip fee is around $93 a ton, but the recycling tip fee, because there still is a market for some of those materials and there still is recycling happening, is a $65 a ton that's going to be to the town. So it still is more beneficial for people to recycle both financially and also uh, for the environment. The savings that was just on the previous slide translates into the taxes. This budget, if you hold everything else in the fiscal year 21 budget that was proposed by the first selectman constant, and specifically either take out pay as you throw or put in pay as you throw, the numbers that were on the previous slide, that's how it impacts the mill rate, 3.42% increase without pay as you throw to cover mostly that additional recycling cost, as well as the increasing uh, costs in incineration. Uh, and with pay as you throw, 2.53%. These numbers are based on here. It's early in the proposal still, but these are the uh, bag proposals, 33 gallon. 33 gallons is that large, kind of your large like toter lining bag, and a 13 gallon is your kitchen style bag, you know, kind of up to like maybe my hip somewhere in there is a kitchen style 13 gallon bag. There's the prices. The price of the bag, as I said, is includes to offset the tip fee. There's also an administrative cost that goes with that. Um, that administrative cost is proposed to cover all the services from A to Z. The town uh, wouldn't, you know, get involved in distributing the bags or trading bags ourselves. That covers the 
creation of the bag, going out to all the retailers in the hundreds of communities that have this throughout the Northeast. Usually, you know, most retailers in the in the towns participate and they carry the bags at no cost to the town. They want to keep the traffic coming in and they want to also provide a good public service. So they uh, uh, participate, carry the bags, but it also co it covers the cost of the bag, the distribution, the billing, the return of the revenue from each of those stores back to the town, as well as some additional enforcement support um, and customer service issues and all the other things that come along with running a program like this. Translating that into the impact on, on households that this column here shows on the no pay as you throw program, that's that 3.42%. Because what we're showing is not the total increase here, but if you look at, we're just showing here the difference in the impact on the budget. If, if we didn't have pay as you throw and did have pay as you throw in there, that mill rating is 3.42% for a property on that no pay as you throw column, assessed at a million dollars in Greenwich, that translates into an additional $105 plus the cost of trash bags that people already purchased versus the pay as you throw and even if taking kind of the more aggressive approach, it's somewhere between five and seven dollars. And this slide here, you know, we it raised a lot of questions with us. Uh, the one bag per week that seems very low. Um, but again, we've pushed, we've contacted. In addition to the towns that they've had, we've contacted towns throughout the Northeast. We've contacted Seattle. Portland, Maine, Worcester that's been doing this since 1992. Stonington's been doing this since 1992. We've talked to their haulers too to find out. And that number pulls up and we've pushed back on deep with that, but over 500 communities, that really is the average. And I emphasize that happens because, you know, the bag is, a total line bag is pretty big. And people are encouraged to recycle more. More goes into recycling. People don't really have it kind of highlights, even just talking, looking at my own trash, kind of highlights that people don't necessarily have an understanding of the volume of trash that they're personally producing, or maybe not exactly paying attention to all the recyclable items or participating. Holly Hill has a lot of great programs already for trash diversion, and we also have a, a lot of dedicated groups of volunteers that are going to be implementing the uh, food scrap recycling um, program along with Conservation Commission. Um, and maybe exploring some additional textile operations. So that's how that waste gets down. And the one bag per week seems, at least in the hundreds of, of communities that have this implemented, that number you know, seems to be the, the uh, number of bags people use. Translating out of the finances, getting into the environmental impact, pay as you throw here uh, has a massive, massive environmental benefit. According to the Connecticut Department of, of Energy and Environmental Protection, bag-based pay-as-you-throw approach is the single most effective avail available means of reducing municipal solid waste. This has been recommended by DEEP for, uh, for years. It's also been recommended by the EPA bipart Bipartisan Administration. Bill Clinton in the 90s EPA recommended it. Uh, George Bush, e his EPA recommended it. Then again, Obama administration EPA has recommended it. And our, um, it, you know, it's recommended by Mass DEP as the single most effective. And, and part of their, the state has an overall goal to reduce trash by 60% uh, by 2024, um, and 40% of that nearly they know can be achieved simply by implementing the bag-based pay-as-you-throw approach. And just taking the conservative estimate here, 13,000 tons of trash reduced is 25,000 metric tons of carbon. And that translates into one of those types of just the different ways to conceptualize that impact on the environment. Um, one that really resonates with me is installing 25,000, equivalent to installing 25,000 solar panels within Greenwich uh, every year. And so obviously it's tremendously powerful in terms of its environmental benefits. Another way to conceptualize this is the plastic bag bans that have been going on. We have data from Westport who had a plastic bag ban for about 10 years, and that um, total cumulative you know, impact in terms of waste reduction is about 390 tons versus over the same time period, same community, 80,000 tons, and you can see the equivalent savings. And again, all these are, are just different ways to kind of conceptualize how, what that means and what that impact is. Uh, they are talking with a lot of communities and have some frequent objections highlighted that kind of occur in, in every community that that, that has brought this up, and actually right now, I was just talking to Kristen this morning, and you know, she's working with a bunch of communities, even across Connecticut, and uh, 
kind of the same, you know, objections, but, and, and they all make sense, but there must be a better way we should study this more. A lot of people feel that ASU Throw is kind of a new program, came out, came out of nowhere, but the state of Connecticut emphasizes that they've been studying this for decades, they've been recommending this program for um, decades, and it's the single most effective way, again, to reduce trash while also saving money. I actually found a few days ago, it might have been last week, an EPA bulletin from 1997 recommending adoption pay as you throw, and it says in there uh, literally the same exact quote in that 1997 bulletin from the EPA, pay as you throw is the single most effective approach to reduce trash. Um, this is unfair. A lot of people think that now, uh, a few different things, this is unfair to good recyclers because they're going to end up paying more. And people often think just from some of the calls I've gotten that they're not currently paying anything for you know, their trash disposal, uh, that you know, it's buried within the taxes so they don't even really necessarily think it just gets picked up or they drop it off. And, but there is a cost. They're also paying to have that incinerated through property taxes at the moment. And the way the system's set up right now is people that are really good recyclers or don't produce a lot of waste or are focused on trying to zero waste their own houses are then forced to subsidize people that choose not to recycle or that don't worry about their own waste production. Um, it's being paid by flat rate through the property tax. So <coughs> the, the resident that's really good about recycling is, or, or bringing their stuff down to goodwill is subsidizing the people that choose not to do that under the current system. Another uh, common concern is that this is a regressive, a more regressive approach to waste management, and pay as you throw is uh, just not more regressive than any of the other options that are currently out there. The town's facing an increase in the recycling charges, so something has to be done. And kind of the main options are any of the, either raising property taxes, implementing tipping fees, or pay as you throw program. A tipping fee, you know, a regressive tax. I kind of have just so. People know regressive tax, just looking at the IRS definition, is a tax that takes a larger percentage of income from low-income groups than high-income groups. Um, and so this is often a concern here. Tipping fees, they don't take in any account of, you know, are the most regressive option. There's no account on ability to pay in a tipping fee, it's just a flat fee. Everyone pays the same for their either tonnage or for their drop-offs at Holly Hill. Uh, it also gives people no direct control over their personal costs and has no incentive to reduce trash. And if anything, depending on some of the programs around the state, some of them encourage people to you know, get their money's worth in terms of when they're dropping off their trash. Raising property taxes, also property taxes, just using the IRS definition, they don't take into account someone's ability to pay the fee. So it's the same flat mill rate to everyone, regardless of your ability to pay. But specifically here in Greenwich, um, people don't have any personal control over their waste costs. And people that want to zero waste their own or, or, or reduce their own direct waste costs don't have that ability here because they then have to subsidize people that choose not to. And also, um, people that are trying to lower their direct personal cost are even subsidizing some of the other, you know, they have to subsidize people like, you know, some of the private schools or the hospitals where they're being forced to subsidize them, so they don't have any opportunity there. Pay as you throw gives all residents the opportunity to control their expenses for solid waste. Gives them the opportunity, as, as Dean was just emphasizing this morning, the opportunity to work towards zero waste, something that they don't have now. And there's also a lot of flexibility in, in the program. It has, there's program that can be designed to reduce the burden on uh, low-income communities or people that would unfairly share an additional burden of a fee, um, but also maintaining the massive benefits to taxpayers and the huge environmental impact that pay as you throw has. <coughs> Finally, just diving into enforcement, um, pay as you throw <coughs> compliance is, is very high. Again, 550 programs in the Northeast have this. We've talked to tons of towns, we've talked to tons of haulers, and within six weeks, essentially they have 100% compliance. All the issues are, are usually hammered out of the program. People generally they want to do the right thing. People want to do programs that help out the environment, and want to participate in programs, so it's really not an issue. Illegal dumping is often a concern. We were specifically concerned about that, and we've been reaching out to a lot of communities to talk about that, and um, basically no community has come back that said that, that it's happened there. If you've had illegal dumping issues before implementing pay as you throw, then you're likely to have the same exact experience after. If you're like Greenwich where you don't have illegal dumping issues, 
before pay as you throw, you're likely to have the same experience after. It's still illegal, and the bag fee is specifically set only to, to, to cover that cost. That's why the bag fee is low. We spoke to um, town specifically about the legal dumping issue and compliance and how, how it will work. And that's been the feedback, it, you know, solidly that we've been getting. Sanford, Maine is kind of on the bottom. Within week one, they already were at 96% compliance, and within the first few uh, weeks of the program, they were near pretty much 100% compliance there. Um, that is that is it for this. So I'm going to hand it over to Min. Unfortunately, Kristen, she was the deep consultant. She was supposed to be here to answer a lot of questions and stuff. She was going to wait after the meeting. Um, I'm going to be work, especially for some of the more detailed questions or technical questions or questions that people uh, might have. I know she's kind of reached out to some of the haulers already, trying to. And I want to work with some people, but she's going to have more office hours in upcoming weeks, and also through me, we can coordinate conference calls with her, more information to get a lot of the technical <coughs> questions answered. So she wanted me to emphasize she apologizes she wasn't here, but she will be readily available to answer a lot of the questions. Blaze, thank you so much for that thorough presentation, and uh, we'll, I know there's several holders here, so we're going to get that out there, so when she's coming back, you all can uh, meet with her one-on-one -on -one and answer it. Have your questions answered on here? Uh, Instead of office hours, so with that, everything. Yes, yeah. we'll, so we'll get that out there in an e blast to everybody. Do you have any questions on that? The email Alex. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Yes, I did actually. I, I, um, so, first of all, thank you for all of your hard work on it on the environmental side. Um, Anything that we can do to reduce trash is a great thing, actually, and uh, I want to get to that. I did have a question, though, about plays about your presentation, which is slightly different than it was on Monday, where we raised a lot of my questions. You, you know that everything stays the same and that there are no changes except for the bags, but isn't the whole idea behind it behavioral change? The reason you're going, right, there are two, as I said when we talked about this on Monday, let's split the environmental goals, which is <coughs> Waste reduction, that's where we want to go. We want to figure out how best to do waste reduction and the economic side of it because this is just raising the cost to the homeowners, whether you pay for it in your taxes or whether you pay a bag fee. It is an added cost, um, so we'll come to the cost issue. So I'm not quite sure I understood when you said everything stays the same because I understood it to be the purpose of this is a behavioral change, right? right. Am I it was the same PowerPoint. Um, but I, but I didn't remember you saying from Monday, you're, I, I think our goal is not that people throw out trash the same way, right? Because then you wouldn't have the reduction. It's the same operation, they just throw out less trash because they experience the direct cost. So it's not everything stays the same. Well, there's less trash. But How would they throw out less trash? I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. Sir, 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 you have to you, you raise your hand if you want to be acknowledged. You can't. Hold on one second. But I, I, just, I just wanted to point out that the goal, I think the goal is how do we encourage people to produce less trash? So then I, would, I guess my next, right? That's our goal eventually, right? To environmental improvement, um, which I think is great. So I guess I'm, I'm, one of the questions I hadn't thought about on Monday is, what portion of that bag fee, I would guess some portion of it must be used to in, improve our recycling programs, or our education programs. What portion of that bag fee has been allocated for uh, programs that will help people understand options for reducing, reducing trash? That, that bag fee, the fee for the vendor, which would be waste zero, includes both educational component and enforcement component and the bag distribution component. They have an extensive uh, documentation on how do you it, not to give them options of hey, here's this program itself, but here's the other way you can reduce your trash by re re educating them on the recycling program we already we already have. So they have that that part of but their curriculum if you will for so public so education. Right. So you'll be able to provide uh, the public with information as to what portion of that fee is going to environmental education. They currently have they have not broken it down that way. We can see if there's if they have a demarcation uh, that way. But that that would be great. And and what portion is the town then? If we're going to be enhancing our recycling efforts and um, you know other than the volunteers, which I want to get to, on how our sustainability enhancement committee can work better with the town to encourage the. Uh, my understanding is that the the dense food waste food scraps 
is what really weighs down a lot of the trash. So uh, what is the town going to be doing to encourage the proliferation of that program, which will help people reduce trash? So I'll, uh, I'll let our Commissioner Butler speak to the program that uh, will be starting. We're, we're working with SCRAP, but it's the Food Scrap pilot program will be beginning in April of this calendar year. So if you want to add to that. So GRAB, the Greenwich Recycling Advisory Board, has been extremely um, involved in trying to get the word out, already get out, um, sort of like a soft start for that kind of program. They've been working with, I think, the, how much of the caboodle, what do you say? A number of uh, different groups through the uh, through conservation uh, to get that, that word out. Uh, and also conservation, you've already had a program going on for food scrap recycling. Granted, not for everyone, but even at home, you know, right. to try to educate people because there are there are multiple options. People could do it at home, <coughs> or then they'll be able to take part in that process and probably help. But uh, so that which is great, I and mean, the project is great and fully supportive. I guess I wonder whether we you talked about or considered whether the town's going to support expansion of that, so that if our goal is trash reduction and if we know that the heavy food scraps and the waste is a large component of that, how are we supporting these private citizens, essentially, who are, why is this town not owning that program, and should we be, have we discussed it as a portion of the bad fee, which is going to hit our taxpayers, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't that be used to enhance our environmental efforts town-wide? So a couple observations about that. So again, we have a pilot, so we want to get the pilot going, so we can see then how would we build it or grow it, let's see how it goes. A couple other things can happen with pay-as-you-throw. Um, with pay-as-you-throw, you can, even in your own home, what you can start doing is working on your own inventory control, shall we say, of your own refrigerator, your own food scraps. So there is evidence that people, as they start to see what they are throwing out, like, gee, maybe I don't want to waste that food. I don't want to leave it in. Maybe I shouldn't buy so much, or I will maybe be able to adjust. So there. Going to be changes that we'll see between food scrap recycling, between as you throw in those behavioral changes you're alluding to, that can then inform what would be the next steps that we would need to broaden that food scrap program. You know, what would it be need to be broadened to, and so on and so forth. There also are going to be changes, presumably on the commercial side, that we'll have to see uh, how that works. And we're also hoping to see support in Connecticut for you know better support for for permitting for composting facilities. You know, that needs to grow and build also. Um, you know, I think you may have seen that, Fred, in your, your time up with in, in the state, and I bet you're familiar with it, Joe. That's yeah. something also that needs, that's gonna be evolving. So I would just encourage, as you're thinking about this program, that, as we talked about in money, that it not be looked at in isolation, and that the, the, the way it becomes effective for, um, waste reduction is behavioral change and providing alternatives and um, which I think the town should be should support lower lowering our waste and figuring out what's the best uh, <coughs> composite program education environmental practices that will allow for waste reduction the f and then I had a number of questions as you know from the other day but for the audience uh, related to how you set the fee and who it impacts and why this fee I'm very concerned about the impact on the lower income residents in our community the Alice population uh, so much about this has to do with behavioral change uh, as goal for trash reduction so if you're using a cost metric to influence behavioral change you have to make sure that the fee hits the people that, so I, I'm just, you know, it, there's a lot of implementation questions of a commercial, and uh, Mr. Siebert, right now we don't charge a tipping fee, except for some practices. We charge a tipping fee for some practices, right? For like um, uh, organic waste and things like, right? There's some things, but- do Certain waste streams. Certain, yes. but the commercial property owners, they, their trash, when it gets picked up, do they pay a? There are, there is no tipping fee for trash. So when we say trash, that material that we think of that we throw out in a business or a home, because rooms are combined and town rooms are private, that material is weighed, but we don't have a fee for that. So I guess I'm just concerned about how, if the goal is behavioral change, um, 
how it translates down the line from the feed to commercial establishments, to their workers, to their practices. All of that would need to be spelled out in the justification of a, of a, of a, of a cost that's going to get imposed on residents. I think currently your operation, the operational budget for solid waste removal is somewhere around $4 million a year, right? For garbage. Yeah, for garbage. Just, for garbage. Yeah. yeah, so 22,000 households told me the other day it's roughly $182 a day that a household is paying. We're putting another, would you say, bag $100 on top of it. It is a fee to our homeowners that I want to make sure that we've thought out um, very carefully on the how we, we do the so I look forward to having this dialogue and um, really hearing how the environmental side of it um, how we're going to push move that forward one of the event that one of the prime responsibilities of the conservation commission is public education um, so we do have a standing program to help people understand backyard composting we are supported working with grab uh, for the food scratch because it expands the thing that you can compost um, textiles, I mean, we've the hatteries, and we've already opportunities for floats. Uh, we've got to get back on to opportunities for our paint recycling, because I understand the closest store has now closed. Um, so that's conservation does, that's our primary role is educating. Uh, so we expect to be a very big part of it. We, we expect a lot of conservation. We do. For a limited staff and limited budget, and arguably maybe if we're expecting them to do even more, we yeah. might need to. Um, Thank you, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Gentlemen. Uh, I have a number of problems with this program. Um, let me stand up because I, sure. I, I want to I make a number of points. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sir, would you also state your name? State your name. My name is Mark Fichtel. I'm a oh. resident of Greenwich. You and I have talked for um, the waste removal services cost in 2017-18 was five million seventy-four thousand five hundred and eighty-four dollars. In 2018-19 it was budgeted at five and a half million dollars and it came in at five million two hundred and seventy-seven thousand five hundred and seventy-nine dollars or about two hundred and thirty thousand less than the uh, for this year it is forecast at Four million six hundred and sixty-five thousand three hundred and twenty dollars. Now, I'm assuming that that forecast is because pay-as-you-throw is the thought is pay-as-you-throw might cut how much goes in so they can lower their costs. But if I just took the five million five hundred thousand that was forecast for last year and the whole reason for this pay as you throw, and this is one of the things that kind of aggravates me about these presentations that I see on this board. The whole idea of this increase was because we were facing a $912,000 increase. So if I add 5500000 and $912,000, our cost is going to be $6,412,000 for the coming year. Um, I have not been able to get um, and, and I thank uh, Commissioner Siebert for calling me back when I called her. But when uh, I uh, talked to her office, they basically, uh, I don't know how else to put it, blown me off. Uh, when I've wanted to get information on how much tonnage Greenwich has to transfer out, both trash and recyclables. I also don't know and can't find out how much we're paying to transfer out trash per ton and in total and recyclables per ton in total. Now I know in the past we actually didn't pay to get rid of the recyclables, but I can't get any of that information until people in this town know that information. There's going to be a great deal of suspicion about this program and we need to be able to get that. Now I want to address one other thing and then I'll show you. <coughs> Greenwich has 22,250 households. I don't know how many commercial establishments it has. So I haven't worked commercial establishments into my numbers. 
The average household in Greenwich, according to 2018 census estimates, is 2.8 people. My wife and I live alone. We occasionally have our kids visit us. We have three children, but they don't visit us all that often. Uh, and we recycle aggressively. We use between one bag a week on average, the big bags. And with our, when our kids visit, we might occasionally have an extra bag, plus holidays and you know, Christmas and all that. We use between 60 and 65 bags a year. That's two of us. So a, an average household is going to use between 90 and 100 bags per year. <laughs> They're estimating $2 per bag. Oh, by the way, given what they did with the parking, I can't believe those aren't going to be taxed. So this isn't going to be $2. It's going to be $2.12. Give, give them time, they'll tax. Yeah, they'll tax, they'll tax. The cost per bags on that basis is not going to be $110, it's going to be $180 to $200 per family, per household. If you make that, if I take the 180, the low end, times 22,250 households, that's $4 million for Greenwich. If I take the high number, I'm taxing it, which is $213. It's four and three quarter million dollars. We were only supposed to offset 912,000. What the hell's with all this extra money? We elected our selectmen to run this town efficiently and at l as low a cost as possible. You're generating an extra three to three and a half million dollars that wasn't necessary. Now, Maybe what you're doing is you're imposing what I'll call a bag tax rather than putting something into the property tax. But you're adding a tax on people in the town and you're trying to pretend it isn't a tax. I also want to cover a couple of other things. Waste, waste, waste Zero, which is the company that produced these slides, is going to get 15% of the revenue. I don't know if anybody noticed that. But you do the math, they're getting 15% of the revenue. On the high estimate that I gave you, $4 million, that's $600,000. We were supposed to be covering $912,000. They're getting two-thirds of what we were supposed to cover. And on the high number, they're getting $711,000 out of the nine twelve. So they're getting almost all of what we were supposed to cover. Um, also, there's a, the final slide in here says you're supposed to put in what they call a tiered enforcement system if it doesn't exist. Well, I don't think it exists, and I'd love to know what that's going to cost. Um, I'll see. I have a lot of problems with this property. And, and, and by the way, this is a very regressive tax on people who are not wealthy in this town. And I gotta tell you, any time you read about Greenwich, it's wealthy Greenwich. The last thing we need in the press is to have the press say, look what Greenwich did to all its poor people. <clears throat> they screwed them royally by imposing a really regressive tax. And oh, by the way, I'm not known as a liberal. So for me to, to make that comment is really tells you how aggravated I am about this bank tax and what it's going to do to the poor people in this town. And I live in Byron, by the way, which is Western Greenwich, which is the least uh, wealthy part of Greenwich. Mark, thank you so much, and thanks for your, uh, your emails and calls. Um, number one, you saw the three, Mark, there was three options, right? They're all regressive, because one, if we don't do anything, it's going to, the mill rate's going to go up, so that's not good. The tipping fee is the most regressive of all of them. This one here off is regressive, but it offers you some control. The other two don't over your, your, what you produce. Now, I grew up here, too, and I, you know, very working class. Um, I lived in Byron for a while, so I, I get all that. But 
we're not hearing that argument that look what they're doing to the poor people in these 550 so other communities like that. I get what you're saying. Um, the one thing you, you pointed out there was the, that uh, I had a question about was the tiered enforcement. I know we had, when we went to recycling in 1989, we had people on the tipping floor there, usually one, there may have been two at some point. Um, we heard a lot of this in 1989. We recycled, we were mandating glass, metal, plastic, cardboard, and newspapers. People went berserk. I was in that industry then. Uh, the others didn't like it either. Uh, it, was good. it was new. It was different. We ended up working more for less. Um, I get that. But it was the right thing to do. And within a few months, people forgot about it. In 1991, the Granite Oilers got together and the town of Greenwich, and we, we went to a voluntary pilot program for mixed paper and became a leader in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we do very well here, recycling. So these concerns. I knew, we knew they were going to come up with, if we did nothing, right, then you shouldn't have elected it, any of us. We're giving you an option here, again, if you want to go to a tipping fee, which really gives you no control or anything, I, that, that, I wouldn't like that, but we'll, we'll certainly, you know, listen to people's comments. Yes. So Fred, let me just say, uh, a, a mill rate uh, change on a $912,000 increase, which is what you've been told, on a $33.3 billion base, the mill rate change would be 0 0.0012, which would, uh, seven, which would be roughly a $27 increase. No, and I, and I think so, your, your point about the 912 is, I'm glad you mentioned that. Because there are some people who have been writing letters and op-eds to the paper complaining about a, a, a tipping fee. And sometimes they always don't have their information, right? But they're always accusing. And they want to know why we don't have a tipping fee here. Uh, not telling you that it would be circular, that the hall is going to have to turn around and, 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 and transfer that cost per, you know, that he's getting onto the, to the homeowner. I've talked to the haulers. A lot of them are breaking it down. It could be anywhere from $10 to $25 a month extra. You can't expect the haulers to eat that. These are small business people. But these are people who live in our community. We talk about poor people. These are people who get up at 3.30 in the morning and they, and they, they work hard. And they're out there in all types of weather. Uh, they give us backdoor service, right? Most towns you go to, and they have, if they have them uh, uh, on the uh, curb like we used to have with the blue bins, doesn't look nice, and it blows all over the place. So we're, they've done a great job, uh, and I can tell you, you don't, you can't expect them to eat that cost. So again, some of the same people that may be, you know, complaining about this, not you, Mark. Um, you know, they're going to write an op-ed, maybe. They're going to write a letter to the editor. But they're the same people that have been crying for a tipping fee, but yet they don't like this. So what do they want? Do they want higher taxes? We've given, them, we've given an option here, one that gives people personal control. And it, it's economically and environmentally the right thing to do. If you have another option, let's hear it. We're all ears. But we were presented with this, with the international market collapse with recycling. To do nothing would be a lack of leadership. So we presented it. And I, you did your homework, Mark, and I truly appreciate everything you said. Um, but again, we're looking, if you have any other ideas, let us know. But to do nothing, then you shouldn't have gone to the polls in November and, and, and voted this way. That's my take on it. Yes, Don? Fred, uh, what do these bags cost to produce at a factory? That I don't know, Don. I know we all buy bags anyway. Right? These are a little bit more expensive because we buy them in bulk. Right. Um, so you wouldn't have to buy those black plastic bags we, we all have now. I can tell you, I had five people in my house last summer and we recycle. I had less than one bag of garbage because we recycle everything and that's without the food scraps. Uh, when hopefully, you know, when that gets going in April or May, that's going to come down more. Um, it, it, takes, it just takes a while to get used to it, but I, I can get you the, the figure if you want. Well, I was just curious because, you know, if you go into a supermarket and you buy a, a box of glad bags or something, garbage bags, 
and there's 50 in a box, you're paying eight, nine dollars, ten dollars, and you got sure. how many bags? Sure. Well, we're talking about two dollars a bag times how many times a month you're going to need a bag times how many months there are in a year. It's quite a bit difference. Well, the, if you cost. do that 13 gallon bag, which is, I, it's in Blaze's office, it's, it's pretty big. It's what I would use. And that's again, I, I'm probably you know, much, much more of a recycling nut. It would be about $60 a year. $60 a year for one of those bags. That's what I would use. Some people are going to use more. And if you cook a lot, you're going to have, that's why the food scrap program would be really beneficial because I don't cook. I'm not home every night cooking. So I, I, that's, I'll throw that out there. So it would be a lot more than that 13 gallon bag. But that's what I, I produce. But, you know, the food scrap program will certainly help that if people uh, avail themselves of it. But I'll get you that. That Alex, how are you? There. How are you? Uh, my name is Alex Mikosa, and I'm here primarily more as, as a civilian and mom. Um, you know, my husband does have a, 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 a polling uh, business. And I think that one of the things that Mr. Oberlander pointed out is critical here. And I think the reaction and everything that we're hearing right now, you know, and the response is because I don't think that we were thoroughly the community is not thoroughly educated about this. All right? It's like, it's a great message, but the delivery fell short. And I think, like you said, you know, with time, everybody will get used to it, but to, like many people have said, this was a little premature, like you just have to do it and you have to do it now, and that kind of stuff, you know? And you have to give people, you know, that, that, that education for them to understand it. Not everybody has Facebook. Not everybody, you know, um, get in, can get into the website. You know, some of this, especially the majority of the seniors may not have a computer or be able to go to the library and do this. I think that if, you know, there's a, a more educating process and, you know, um, Commissioner Sieber is doing a, a, another, you know, program is working on something else that, like you said, you know, once that, um, compost thing is going that's another low uh, that could lower the numbers because <coughs> the reality is it doesn't matter what whether there's the bags or whether it's a tipping or whatever it is at the end of the day it's still going to go back to the to the people and to the community do not get onto somebody wrote a report and it was so long ago and it was so annoying but for anyone that thinks that any of this haulers are lining their pockets with money <laughs> You have got to be crazy, and you want to talk to me about it, okay? Because I barely see my husband because the hours that he keeps. My daughter barely got to keep see my my husband because the hours that he kept. So come talk to me. I could put my number out there. Actually, it's probably the out there too, and ask me. But I think that the is the education. I also did a little, you know, a, a searching when this all arose, and. I contact some people on Amparts, and they do have all this in place. You know, they have the compost, and, and they have the bags. You know, buy as you purchase. You know, you, as you throw, and so forth. But their dynamics is a little bit different. Especially, I spoke with someone in Amparts, and their dynamics is a little bit different. Why? Amparts is a huge farming community. So any compost or anything, they, it goes to the farms. You know, my daughter goes to UMass. They have one of the largest farms. This is part of the school. A lot of stuff goes to them. Uh, they have a, also a system with the restaurants, you know, with the commercials, that they are instructed they have to do certain things and either donate that food or bring it right into the compost. It's not to be put in the garbage. So there's a lot of components that we need to get educated before we actually nail it. You know, it's just, I feel that people feel suffocated. They're pressured. We gotta do this, and why are we doing this? And what's gonna cost this, and how eventually it's gonna impact you, <clears throat> the haulers, and the commercial businesses, and everybody else. Because it is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which way we paint this ducky, it's gonna quack, and it's gonna cost. So, you know, that's my take into it. Thanks, Al. Thank you. I, I'd just like to follow up on what she just said. Um, I have talked to, and I attend various meetings around town, I have talked to, at, and, and I also go to the gym uh, every day, and I have talked to at least, I don't want to exaggerate, 40 people in the last two weeks, including five people here at Town Hall. And I said, what do you think about pay as you throw? 
every single one of them said it, huh? Nobody knows about this. So, I, I mean, you know, before you even think about doing anything, you've got to put something out, a mailer to everybody in town. It can't, you know, go on the website or, because people just don't check that. Right. And, and, and we put things in the papers and... and you they know, don't, the papers have minimal you, you, circulation. So you, you, try, you try the right. papers, social media, um, you do all you can, but certainly um, we'll do, you know, as we go forward, we're going to do town hall uh, forums and, and things like that. So. I agree with you, and not everybody has a computer. Not everybody reads the paper, sometimes for good reason. Um, so uh, I get it. Um, not you can. <laughs> or Leslie can. Um, <laughs> 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 um, but anyway, uh, that's quite well taken. Yeah, I'm Sean Ulrich. I'm a former member of the BET. And I would like to commend this gentleman for doing his homework. He, he did do his homework. I would point out that a few years ago, um, I and a colleague on the BET put out budget guidelines that included requiring the uh, commercial trash rollers to pay a tipping fee. And uh, to this lady's uh, comment about lining their pocket, the person who made that comment at a budget hearing was town administrator John Prairie. And he said that the commercial haulers were lining their pockets at taxpayer expense. The reason was that we pay, as Commissioner Siebert pointed out at that same hearing, we pay a, a trash collection fee that is on par with other communities in our region, yet we are the only municipality that does not require commercial haulers to pay a tipping fee uh, to the town. So a tipping fee is included everywhere you go in that trash collection fee homeowners pay and yet is not paid out to the town to compensate for the use of our uh, material recycle recovery facility that's about four million dollars so i would like to ask a couple of questions i'm sorry i have to use board selecting time but as with this gentleman i submitted some written questions and those were not answered by your administration i didn't see them we have a four-page memo there. Oh, you don't, okay, I did not see it. Oh, let me ask a couple of questions. On this, it said that the collection, the uh, carting cost of the town per ton was $93 and change. Yet a year ago, when I asked, it was about $95, and that a tipping fee that we would normally be charging to commercial haulers would be $105 to $108. So has the cost, um, or city carting per ton gone down over the past year. Second, uh, apropos of the recycling, uh, a year ago we had 7,000 tons of recycling coming out of Holly Hill. Now, you're telling us that it's about 938,000, 7,000 at that time. So $938,000 for recycling, <coughs> that implies a cost of over $100 and yet your slide shows $67 per ton. So what is, the what is the municipal solid waste volume that we're putting out now, and the recycling volume, and what are the carting fees per ton that are being charged for um, recycling and for municipal solid waste now? And could you tell us, since this is supposed to be a, a beneficial effect of going to recycling, how much of that recycling, what proportion, actually gets recycled as opposed to being sent over to landfills in Vietnam or elsewhere? To my understanding, is it's very low. I know it's unfortunate what happened in China, not except that's come down a lot. Mark, was that some of the your questions with the tonnage that you were asking the other day? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to, I've got a, a thing here, I'll leave it with. Commissioner Siebert, and hopefully they'll send me the information. And it's in the presentation. Uh, but but I wonder if you can ask my, <coughs> ask my questions first. Yeah, please, please, go ahead. Please go ahead. <coughs> so you want, your question is, how much would this went from 95 to 93? So why, why is that? It didn't actually go down. No. So, so uh, back in the day when we were looking at, as, as we looked at these numbers, you have a tipping fee and we have a, an operations fee we pay monthly. 
So sometimes, Sean, back in the day when we were looking at these things, if you take the operations fee and blend it in with your tonnages, you can look at a per ton fee on that basis, or you can look at the straight dollars per ton that is the actual tip. So 93.66 coming on the 1st of July is our current tip fee. We still have, we still pay for operations of Holly Hill. So, that, so that's why those that figures are- Is fee plus real operators to do fee? So, so the 93.66 is what we're paying to have it taken out the door and disposed of. So we, we are not privy to what our contractor may or may not be paying on any spot basis or their long-term contracts and so forth, but that's why there can, it can be confusing when you start looking at these numbers. We recycle about 14,000 tons approximately a year, so I'm not sure where that 7,000 is from, but those figures are in the presentation. The averages for the MSW produced and the recycling are in that presentation, which I know for was I think in the attachment that went to, you know, that's the links that <coughs> went out for everyone for the web page. So those figures are in there, in addition, of course, to the annual report. So the 7,000 tons was, um, came in a note from Mr. Collins, who's the head of the Holly Hill facility, a year ago. Yeah, so I would have to go, we'd have to go back and look at what that. So we're more on about fourteen thousand. Patrick. But I think the main thing to do is to look at the figures that we have that are that are in all our reports and analyses. I don't know what specific uh, you know, I know you guys sometimes have gone back and forth on different issues. It's hard to know what without sitting and staring at that, hard to know exactly what's going on. And the other question was, what percentage of those fourteen thousand tons? actually gets recycled as opposed to being burned or going to land. Right, we would have to, you know, triple check that, but we, you know, that certainly is a concern that Brad has and, and, and we all have. To the best of our knowledge, the outfit that takes our recycling is doing its best to find locations to send it, to see it actually still recycled. And I say it's perfect, that I couldn't say since I'm not the recycler, uh, but they do strive to make sure that they've they've been pretty successful with uh, glass. Uh, they had some, you know, they've had a number of good contracts that were helping them that had things locally. Uh, but it certainly is a challenge for everybody as things are moving forward. But we are seeing that folks are still trying their best to find recycling endpoints for that material. I just ask because if we're shifting from municipal solid waste to recycling. But in fact, most of what is shifted over still goes to a landfill, or still goes to a trash a waste to energy conversion facility. There is no environmental improvement. Yeah. I had asked that question because when we went to single stream in 2011, <coughs> more things were thrown in there, and it was able to be commingled, so it was easier, and our numbers went up. Since this market, uh, collapse internationally, uh, I asked the other day if the recycling numbers were that much different, and they really are not, which I thought was surprising to me, because I thought they would have been way down. You know, it's, it's, we're going to see a shift and a change in markets over time. And it always, it always fluctuates. Right. Some things were, yeah, that, that was forever. Right. And it is, it, you know, Sean, your point's a good one, and it speaks to the whole point about uh, what, Joe, you were saying, behavioral change and waste reduction. Whether you can reduce your trash, and even if you can reduce your recyclables, the more you can reduce any of those waste streams, hopefully both of them together, the better off we'll be, and the better it'll be for you know, figuring out these, as, as all these things are shifting and moving. People have gotten back to me, they said since the conversation started, they're watching what they throw away now, and it's, it's, it's amazing how many people have told me that. But I know, Tommy, you'd mentioned, uh, Tommy Philadelphia, that uh, you used to get paid how much for cardboard recently, how much was it per ton? What we used cardboard. to get paid? Cardboard. What we used to get paid? Yeah. $120. And now it's? Paying to get rid of it. You're paying to get rid Some of it. Some places, yeah. Except for print. <coughs> okay. Well, that's how you pay to get rid of it. Susan. Hey, I'm, uh, Susan Foster. I just want to say <coughs> first to this team, really great work. Um, but you did amazing research, and Sean, I know that you've done a lot. Uh, 
behavior change is really difficult. I, I used to work for Keep America Beautiful, and recycling is one of their strong arms. You know, what's going on inside this room is behavior change is really difficult to do. And you, you got to get people over that hurdle. Those towns in Maine, I spend as much time in Maine as I do here in Greenwich. <clears throat> Those are poor towns. And I've seen some of the battles in Maine for this, you know, to, to get it going. Um, but huge success stories. And, uh, you know, we really, you know, there's two things going on here. There's the $962,000. And could we be a, a better, better environmental steward of town? You know, can we set an example? I mean, it's kind of crazy in a way that Maine is running circles around us in Greenwich to be doing this. Um, so, I do, his math was very interesting to me. I really do wonder if they're really, are we going to really generate in excess of three million dollars to the town? I mean, if that's true, that's like a really interesting thing, um, and I would be curious as to how you plan to spend that money. Um, but I, I applaud this going forward. I don't, people need to understand the higher the fee, the better. All the research supports that, no matter how much, look, do I want to be paying it? No, I don't want to pay it. But I know for a fact, the higher the fee, the quicker the behavior change. And it will be, it, and you've seen it on the slides, it is almost instantaneous. That's why the mistake on the, the bags, the single-use bags, putting it at a nickel was a huge mistake. If you, we had put it at a quarter, we would have forced much more aggressive behavior change. So anyway, I, I think no matter what, you have to figure out where that $962,000 is coming from. It forced, it forced, <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It forced me to tell you. I always get the plastic bags because I have lots of dogs, and I reuse them. But I don't like paying for them. Now, so I, I also take the, the reusable bags. Um, but, but there's two, things, two other things I want to just say. Sure. I think we could do some small things that could make a difference. So one of the things that was instituted at the dump, uh, the transfer station, excuse me, um, was, you know, paper, shredded paper was flying all over the place because it was being thrown into the mixed use. And I said to the guys, why don't you create a voluntary place for this? I really, you know, Greenwich people want to comply. And so they do that now. I think we should, hearing today that there's money in glass, I, I know there's money in metal. Why don't we have a voluntary thing? I mean, half of Greenwich goes to the transfer station. We could do a separation voluntary on glass if there's real money in that for the town. You know, it was a mistake. I mean, a single screen was a mistake in some ways. Glass shouldn't be mixed in with that material. You know that, Fred. I know that. You know, it's a big issue. Um, it, it could be something that we could do, a very little easy thing. Another thing that I notice all the time, I take my trash to the transfer station. I, came from an area where this is very unusual, so I do, we just started doing and we've been doing it for 30 years. My husband and I are there every week, and we see a lot. There's a lot of non-compliance. I know that people say there isn't, but there is. Uh, there are aerosol cans being thrown into the mixed things. There's baby toys, mixed plastic and metal. All of that stuff destroys back in recycling was valuable. Destroys an entire load when someone does something like that. Now today it doesn't really matter, but the other reason why, going to Sean's thing, why we should change, it took so long to get Americans to recycle. This is just the economic environment today. It would be cheaper just to throw everything into the ground, right? And if we change, if we, we do away with recycling, and we've done all of this to try to bring it back again when it becomes in, uh, economically a necessity, Americans are going to have an extremely difficult time buying it the second go round. So it would be a terrible thing to start saying to people, we don't need to recycle because it's all getting burned or thrown away. You know, put in the ground. I mean, it's, we'll never be able to get that behavior back. So that's why I think if we can do some little things where people, things like this glass thing or metal separation, um, we could, people would understand there's still value in recycling. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. And just to circle back with the $912,000 issue uh, for recycling, um, there has been some, again, as you just heard, that have been pushing for a tipping fee for years, right? So it's about $4 million. Um, I found out the other day that there are a couple towns closest that don't have one, but it's still at 169 municipalities. We're one of the few that doesn't have them. Um, I thought we were the only one that didn't have them. And for years, 
I argued against it because it was going to be circular, right? They were just going to turn, the hole was just going to turn around and charge the third person. Um, but with this, you know, and, and again, this, that was coming up again, the tipping fee. Regardless, it, 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 you know, regardless of this, it was coming up again. Um, it was coming up last summer around town. Uh, this really pushed it to the forefront about how we're going to address it. And at the same time, if we're going to address it, how, you know, how can we change behaviors? I know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative Republican. I don't like the government telling me what to do either. But you, you learn how to do certain things, right? And um, I love recycling. And I think you know, to co be conservative is you want to conserve the environment too, the, the, the earth, and things like that. So I think it makes perfect sense to do this. And I'm looking at it the whole the whole the cost now, the combination, like not just the nine twelve, but yeah, when you when you make when you make that point, it certainly does. Say, you know, when you are you overdoing it because of this just this charge here. So I appreciate it. In answering answer to Susan's that. question about uh, which you know if if the if the uh, three or four million dollar number is is, is accurate, uh, actually that's one of the reasons that I turned it a. a, uh, a uh, garbage bag tax because, in fact, in the budget, uh, not only is there that decline in the cost of disposal to uh, 4666000 there's also a budget item that shows 2600000 benefit from the tax uh, uh, that is included. And that's one of the reasons the mill rate doesn't go up as much. So it is. It is. A, it's a tax that's being added. It's just not being added to our property taxes. It's a, but it is a tax. Thank you. Any more questions? Mark, I want to give this to you. I, I give it one. Oh, you thank you. I recommend. That's what he was asking. I want you to have one. Too. Okay. Uh, all right. One more question before I move on to the last. Chief W. Chief Marino's been waiting patiently out there. So just just apropos of, of that. Is it not really, as this gentleman pointed out, a shifting from property taxes to this fee based on bags? And if so, could you tell us where your claim for $3.2 million in savings uh, comes from if you were quoted in the past? I, what, what was, I didn't see that, that quote, I didn't see that article, was that recently? Yeah. I was just saying, you know, what I, I could just tell you, the 2.7 roughly in revenue is going to help offset that from the bag fee. But again, it also brings down, certainly the more recycling you have, you're going to have to pay because of the $65 a ton, which we got down to $65 a ton. But still, it's more expensive per ton for municipal solid waste. So you're making it up there, too. So overall, I, you know, we can nitpick it to death, but overall, it, it's a win-win. And it's, we're going to have to pay no matter what. And you'd be writing a blog and, and calling me all types of names if I didn't do anything. You'd say, he's a do nothing, first let them throw them out. Um, or, you know, institute a, a, you know, a tipping fee, because you've been saying that for years. And you've, you've made comments about the haulers uh, in the past, which I found offensive. So, um, and you were wrong. So, no, I'm, I'm doing the best of the three options, and I'm perfectly satisfied. So you can nitpick it to death, you can write whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you saw the presentation there. It, 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 whether you, you like it or not, I can't, I can't control that. But Lance. If you go with the bags, is it still going to be a tipping fee? No. Okay. But there was a, a person who wrote a letter to the editor today calling for both. Um, yeah, exactly. I agree with you, um, but uh, no. Alex? Can I just throw a little number there so we can understand, you know, as far as getting fees and why is this so critical? Because, uh, you know, Mr. Albrecht you know, mentioned that, you know, within the taxes, there's some kind of tipping fee and everything. So if the tipping fee was going to come to the haulers, you know, be clear, that's not going into their pocket. And that's what I was trying to clarify before, that anybody's thinking that this additional money is going to come into the haulers' pocket. It's not, if anything, it's, it's looking glimmer for, for the haulers because just to give you an example, if we were going to do the 108, which is one of the numbers that I had heard, 
you know, uh, for the year for, I'm going to say, company X, that would be $162,491.40 that they will have to have available in the bank to go and make sure that that gets paid every time they go in. That means I have to take a second mortgage in my home to be able to cover that because we don't all get paid monthly. We have people sometimes don't pay for two months or three months. Sometimes they pay every six months. So this is, you know, they need to understand and get educated on how the following system works as well. We have clients that only, you know, we have seniors, little old ladies that we know that they're by themselves and they only have one bag and we go once a week. So we're not going to charge at $30, $40. We charge them maybe $20, $25. But now with tip and fees, we will have to carry that $93 to her somehow, you know? And then taking into, these are the things that I'm saying, take into account how dramatic of a change this is gonna be and how difficult it's gonna be because not everybody is gonna be able to do that. So for, you know, say this gentleman over here, you know, he's paying $40 a month and she's paying $20 a month. And he said that charge, regardless, has to work equal into all the customers, so someone's going to pay more than the other. That doesn't, you know, do as much. You know, so, so the numbers are critical to us, you know, uh, and, and that's what I refer when people thought lining, but believe me, this business is tough. Equipment, you know, it, it's all kind of things involved. And another thing with the tonnage, I think that this was brought up with someone else, and there were which was right, and said, we got to take into consideration weather when it snows, you know, all that, you know, the truck doesn't cipher the water, the truck doesn't cipher the snow, so that counts into that tonnage, you know, that, 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 that you know. So these are kind of like the little things that comes into, into point to point. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alex. All right, thank you so much. Uh, going on to the last item, which is the proposed uh, charter of code change regarding Riversville Road parking patterns. Deputy Chief Mark Marino. charter back in line with what the parking is currently uh, the park current parking utilization on that road the signs are not in compliance with uh, the uh, with the ordinance and the charter so uh, I know we have there were, there were some questions and some concerns of one of the residents uh, or the <coughs> property owners there uh, and just so you know we've uh, I had the uh, midnight officer check the parking on the street overnight the last couple of nights and uh, there uh, both nights there were six cars parked along the western side of Riversville Road in the area that's going to be uh, still uh, per, uh, parking per, uh, permitted so that it'll be uh, will be enough parking there uh, based on the new realignment uh, to accommodate six cars 
we're going to continue to monitor that situation over the next uh, week or so to see if uh, that number fluctuates at all. And uh, the, uh, so the residence on Riversville Road with the line of sight issue is number 11. Uh, the Haggerty's, they originally brought this to the attention of the police department a couple of years ago, more as a safety, uh, public safety issue. Uh, and they're here today. So uh, I don't know if you'd like to hear from them. Sure. Or... I, I, oh, yeah. Ethan Moore and Haggerty were residents of Levin Riversville Road. And so we, we did uh, initiate this, um, sent several emails to the town that were, um, yeah, we went back and forth and there was no solution. Fortunately, um, Deputy Chief Marino is very responsive to our concerns simply because um, there are several cars that park on Riversville Road on our side of the road, which is strictly residential, uh, you know, on our part. And our sight of view is extraordinarily obstructed to the point where you have about a, a one second possibility of getting out of our driveway. And I have two young kids, you know, we have resident, you know, friends and family coming in and out. We have multiple uh, mail, mailmen, uh, delivery people. They're all taking their lives in their hands when they try to exit or, or enter our, uh, our driveway. So, you know, this has been an issue. There should be no parking on that side of the road after five o'clock, obviously, because there's no buddy that lives other than the uh, us and the people next to us. And um, as I said, he's been very responsive, and uh, it's the first time that we've actually had an interaction where we're making some progress. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate that. Anybody else that wanted to uh, to speak on this? Uh, Yes, yes, sir. Yes, my name is Jamie Lavertini. I live in 24 Riverside Road, and I uh, actually that proposal also impacted me uh, because I'm in debt. My house been there for 120 years, and I've been having parking since I bought the house. And, uh, and that's the reason that I bought the house is because uh, I had parking space. And <coughs> if, if they take that away from me, pretty much it's going to impact me, and also the, maybe two, three houses down the road to have a small driveways like, like I do. We understand, I understand that the safety is very important here and, and, and I, really, I, I, really, I really want to comply with that, but uh, what I don't see is that I, I want that they can give us more option of parking in that, in, in that road because I mean, they don't take away a, a very long space of parking. If you see in the picture, now in picture number one, and we're going to lose that to maybe five parking space or six, I don't know what, how much how is the proposal uh, is going to be. And maybe we're making any more. I, I'm, I'm willing to move my car out of, out of, out of, from my house. I, I have no problem with that. But I suggest that we need more parking space besides that because we have three more houses or four more houses that they don't have, they have a it's very limited. Uh, you're, you're across from the school. Excuse me? You're across from the school? Right. No, I'm not across. I'm 24. I'm next to the veteran club, pretty much. You're next to the Polish club? Uh, the no, the veteran club? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the proposal is, uh, with, the, with the realignment, there'll be 11 parking spaces left on that side of the street, uh, in, in that general vicinity, uh, of absolutely less than what there is now. but. Uh, and five of those spaces will be uh, restricted, no parking, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. So, unrestricted on the weekends and holidays, but... Uh, so the less five or six spaces than what's there now? Uh, good estimate. Good estimate, I would think, yeah. And that would help your site line. Um, okay, we, is there anybody else that wanted to... Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. I, uh, I own the hardware store and uh, all the way down by the gas station. Uh, my concern is uh, Glenwood needs more parking. And I understand their issue with the site plan. Why don't they just uh, remove uh, both pathway? There's four spots from the edge right away. Just move the sign down a couple of more and allow a couple of people to actually do park their cars because they do live across the street. Um, my, my question is also from the Vets Club further up. Is there any park? 
probably not because of the width of the road. And I think you are going to lose a bunch of spots. And the other thing that I don't want is, <coughs> is for people who live there, they need to park. And they're going to wind up parking all the way down by the front of my store. And um, the 15 minutes works well um, to allow customers in and out. But um, you know, if somebody just parks there and receives it over, you know, throughout the day instead of night, then there's no customers allowed, that are allowed to, I guess, pre frequent my retail establishment, and then parking then becomes a bigger option, a bigger problem. So that's that's my thought. Maybe there's again, I understand. I was reading the paperwork, and you need six inches, or you're, you're short, and you've got to relocate the street. Um, sign going up, there's got to be some give there. Um, I, I would like to see it possibly. Yeah, I appreciate that. Excuse me, sir, for the record, maybe you have your name? Sure, my name is Sal Scalisi. I'm sorry? Sal, S-A-L, Scalisi, S-C-A-L-I-S-I. Thank you. Okay, well, you know, one of the, um, uh, the fact that property owners wanted to be here, and so we, would like to push this off just so that person can come and also so select woman Raven who lives around the corner yes. can uh, can weigh in on it Absolutely. too so we'll, we'll take this up at the at the next meeting again but uh, I'm gonna take a ride by there and see and I think just to take a sight but I've been out uh, you know 50 million times in my life over there but of course you know I'm never paying attention to parking spaces so I'll, I'll, I will do that this weekend Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank I never would have guessed. <laughs>